What's up guys, Jason here from the Table Monkeys and today we are going to do another video talking about programming and going over some of the training that I'm doing getting ready for the Arm Melted Tournament in August. All right, so the topic of the day is auto regulation, uh, and this kind of ties into a video that Larry Wheels just put out a little over a week ago. Uh, he did a video talking about his deadlift volume PR, where he hit uh, 661 pounds or 300 kilos for nine sets of eight or 72 reps. Uh, and in that video, his trainer talks about how uh, they had some room to play and to auto-regulate uh, that training session even as it was unfolding. So they didn't know if he was going to hit all 72 reps. They didn't want to cause any overtraining or any injuries. So they were going to play it by ear. And basically, he needed to hit 60 reps uh, to make a volume PR. And then he had the goal of 72 reps. So they kind of had that 12 rep range to play with. Uh, where they could have either taken some uh, reps off of the sets or even dropped a couple sets near the end of the workout. Um, so one of the main things that he said in that video that really stuck out to me that I think is like one of the truest statements I've ever heard is the idea that the best program is written day to day. Okay, and the reason I want to talk about this today is because um, I did some auto-regulation with the training day that I want to talk about today, which is my workload and recovery day, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but I also made some adjustments to the exact mesocycle that I'm going to follow, uh, which is what we talked about in the last video was the idea of making a macro uh, cycle, which is your big plan, then breaking that down into like smaller goals, and then your day-to-day -day work that you're going to do to reach those smaller goals. Um, in that video, I had talked about having two training blocks and then a peak uh, after looking at, like after things have started to unfold and realizing where these weeks are exactly going to fall with the other things that are going on uh, in my life, i.e. wife's birthday, things like that. Uh, it is apparent that I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be able to do the four week block, four week block, uh, three week peak the way that I was looking at it. The days weren't going to fall. Uh, correctly, I was going to be pulling. If I had done it that way, I would have had my heaviest pull session two weeks away from the, the meet, and I would have also uh, had some heavy PRs like in the gym real close to that as well. And it just felt like it was going to be not enough time to fully recover and peak properly. Um, so, what I've done uh, in a way to auto regulate this program and sort of write it as it goes was my first training block was four weeks long. The way that the training blocks work, as I discussed in the last video, was basically I have three weeks of uh, heavy gym lifts and lighter table sessions, and then a fourth week where I do a heavier table session and lighter gym sessions. So what I've done uh, is basically this last block that I'm uh, just finished now, I did uh, three, uh, sorry, I did two weeks of heavy gym sessions and then this week is going to be a little bit lighter on the gym session but i'm planning to go pretty balls out uh at the practice should be my heaviest hardest most destroyed practice uh that i go through before actual arm melters which will be uh four weeks out from the actual competition right and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a third block uh hitting gym prs or hitting a new like max effort vector because uh, this this is all revolved around the idea of incorporating the west side and the Toddzilla uh, style training right so um, in uh, the next block that I'm going into after this week I'll be doing a new vector uh, for the first week and second week of that block then because I'm not, I'm not doing any more hard pulling sessions that kind of leads me right into my peak so Hardest pulling session will be here for week seven. So I, I did a real hard pulling session in week four. Then I did heavy gym lifts the last two weeks. This week I'm gonna back off on the max effort arm wrestling specific movements, but I'm still gonna do everything else uh, like pretty heavy and I'm gonna do all my speed work, um, but I'm gonna pull super hard at this practice. And then uh, the next four practices, or one, two, three practices, and then the competition, the next three practices will all be lighter uh, intensity, more about technique and volume, especially uh, these two here. So that's how that's gonna, that's how that's gonna play out, allowing me to uh, push the gym lifts 
as we work closer to the peak. So I'm gonna have max effort, like west side training for these two weeks here. And then for my first week of the peak, I'm gonna drop out the max effort training. I'm gonna, uh, I, if you saw that video, you'll know that I also do push pull days, which we'll talk about. I'm gonna basically test my push and pull movements. So main one being JM press and pull ups. Uh, so I'll do a test week uh, on week 10, which will be in the middle of the week, about 10 days away from the actual competition. And then from there, it'll just be recovery work and like, you know, um, polishing the groove and everything like that, getting ready for the actual competition. So, uh, so that's just a breakdown of how I've decided to change the blocks a little bit and organize my max effort work and my speed work uh, and my heavy pulling sessions to accommodate the other things that I've got going on and make sure that I'm not uh, because of, you know, it, like basically there's something week eight, like week eight is going to be uh, my wife's birthday around the time of the pulling session. So to plan a giant practice and try to kill myself that week wasn't going to make very much sense uh, or wasn't going to be possible. And to push it to the week after was going to be too close to the competition. So looking at it, it made the most sense to break the blocks up differently. It gives me an opportunity to get another vector in before the competition. Um, so basically, I'll talk about the vectors uh, when we get into the into those videos later. But the idea has been that I've been trying to hone my hook and my top roll by rounding out like uh, three different angles which I'll be able to do now if I have that block. I don't have to try to sneak it into the peak somehow, which I really don't think would have been effective, which was one of the plans I was kind of debating with myself whether or not that was gonna make sense. Um, so anyway, that's a long-winded kind of explanation of how I've auto-regulated uh, my uh, mesocycle and my blocks and how my blocks are actually structured now uh, as we get closer to the, uh, to the meet. Um, and now I want to talk about the workload and recovery because workload is one of the main things that I ought to regulate it based on how I was feeling from the work that I was doing. All right, so let's talk about this workload and recovery day. Uh, I want to just explain uh, exactly how I uh, like kind of outline this day for structure and then what I've chosen to do and how I've auto-regulated it. Uh, and then we'll do a quick, I'll show you a quick video of me actually training in the gym and just go over the movements that I'm actually doing. Um, so the way the day is structured is I have some sort of a workload movement that I do for eight sets of eight and I want it to be somewhat grip focused so it's working my hand. Uh, then I have a recovery circuit that consists of uh, monster rolls, jam press, face pulls, lat tri pulls, and uh, reverse hyper, uh, which is for my lower back, which is part of this whole auto-regulation that I'm about to talk about. Um, and basically I do eight rounds. So I'll do my workload movement for eight reps, and then I'll do this uh, recovery circuit like right after no rest. And then at the end of the recovery circuit, I take a pretty decent rest, and then I run through the whole thing for a total of eight rounds. Um, so what I did was originally I started doing uh, deadlifts, for my workload movement with the axle bar and I wasn't doing them all the way from the ground I was doing them from a bit of a block pull like probably a six or eight inch block uh, and then um, or rack pulls is what I was actually doing uh, but with the axle bar so it's still a pretty decent range of motion on the deadlift with a lot of hip flexion and uh, I just started working a new job a couple months ago if you've been following me on Instagram you might have seen uh, my post I'll throw hopefully a quick video up right now uh, showing some cooking and some of the dishes that I've been preparing at uh, Hotel X which has been an awesome experience to get back in the kitchen and find my passion for cooking again but it has required me to be on my feet for you know 10 to 12 hours a day and uh, a lot of it in a sort of a hunched over position uh, and just very taxing on the lower back so to combine that with uh, volume deadlifts uh, has been more uh, then my lower back can handle and definitely causing some uh, overtraining and some unnecessary discomfort. So in order to avoid that, uh, you know, weak things hurt or pain is usually a sign of weakness are two sayings that you hear in Westside a lot. So I figured it's better uh, for me to strengthen my lower back with reverse hyper movements, which has always rehab, rehab my back uh, greatly. I'll sh they'll be at the end of the clip, which I'll talk about, and I'll explain why they're so amazing, but they have fixed my lower back numerous times, 
and uh, I knew that they will do it again, so I programmed those in. But then, in order to keep up with the workload, being some sort of a workload movement for eight sets of eight uh, with grip focus, I decided to do farmer's uh, walk. So obviously it's not eight reps, I just go down the uh, path and back, which is about 30 yards, uh, it's like 15 yards, 15 yards, or 15 meters roughly, uh, both directions, and I'm using the fat grips on these farmer's walks, so it's the same size uh, grip as the axle bar. Uh, very difficult, very taxing on the hands, um, and uh, I'm doing eight rounds of it. So um, I guess the best thing is I'm just gonna play the clip now, and then I'll voice over on that clip and explain what I'm doing throughout each movement and why I chose them. All right, guys, here we go, starting off with the farmer's walk. So I've got the fat grips, um, and I'm trying to really work my hand strength here. I'm not trying to uh, cup the the handles because I don't really want to work my wrist flexion. I want to work my fingers and my thumb and uh, really kind of squeeze and hang on to the bar uh, to work my hand, hand strength overall and that's what's going to fatigue after going back and forth with these things a total of eight times. They're about 90 pounds each uh, right now is where I'm starting. So uh, after the farmer's walk I move right on to the recovery circuit. Uh, the recovery circuit uh, starts with the reverse rolls. It's one of my favorite things to do to recover the hand and wrist. Uh, from you know hard pulling or just hard training because we're always uh, using forward flexion. I only do the reverse uh, flexion here and um, or basically extension uh, <clears throat> to again, one of the best ways to rehab an area is A, balance it out by working the antagonist muscles, but also by, by working the antagonist muscles, you're working the same area of the body, so you're getting blood into the that area of the body without putting any stress on the muscles or tendons that you're trying to rest. Um, so kind of the same concept here with the uh, JM press. They're really light. I'm gonna do the Toddzilla protocol of doing uh, 10 close, 10 wide, or sorry, 10 close, 10 medium, 10 wide, and uh, by the end of this, you know, it's uh, 30 reps every set. I'm going to do it eight times. It's 240 reps. It's about 95 pounds uh, in total on the bar. So that's a ton of volume by the end of the day. Uh, but the weight is so light, I'm not really putting any stress on the tendons. So a lot of blood into the area, a lot of work for the tricep tendons and the elbow joint, uh, but really no uh, stress. And that's the sort of key behind good recovery work. So after this, I'm gonna work on to, uh, or sorry, move on to work on my shoulders. Um, it's really good idea, again, with the antagonist work to do a lot of external rotation uh, because we're usually so internally rotated when we arm wrestle, our shoulders are protracted forward. So I'm just trying to uh, retract my shoulders as much as possible or my shoulder blades with the face pulls. And then same thing with these lat try uh, movement. It's uh, like retracting my shoulder uh, upwards Again, usually we're protracting our shoulder forward and have our shoulder blade um, depressed downward. So this is like the complete opposite of that. And then on to the legendary reverse hypers. So one of the best uh, things that we have at this gym, one of the reasons uh, that I will always go to this gym is uh, this reverse hyper. It saved my back many times. And right away, as I start using it, you can see how it opens my hips up and opens my lower back up as it pulls me under the table. Uh, but then I've got to use all glute and hamstring strength to straighten myself back out. So again, very little stress on the lower back, but tons and tons of work, tons and tons of blood with light weight. I do it for 15 reps over eight rounds. I'm not even gonna do the math now. It's a lot of reps, a lot of sets, a lot of volume in total. And uh, yeah, again, that's the best way to rehab an area. So that's the video, like the video, subscribe, smash that bell, all those things, and monkeys out.